five commissioners here now that constitutes a quorum so that we can conduct business. Uh, I just, just a couple of preliminary remarks. Uh, this is our, I believe, sixth virtual meeting that we've held uh, all on Zoom. Uh, we're becoming a little bit better accustomed to it as we uh, do it several more times. It looks like we're going to continue to be doing it this way for a while. Um, the commissioners will, are the only ones who will have video during the, the meeting, uh, but anyone, as Abe mentioned, if you've got a comment or a question, if you could put it in the Q&A function, uh, Abe will be monitoring that and he will uh, uh, pass those along. Um, also, when we get to a point where there's a presenter or any attendee who wants to uh, make a comment, uh, then Abe can uh, recognize them and let them make a comment as well. And we're, we're, we're going to probably have a number of people who want to make comments about some items on our agenda, uh, particularly the, the discussion with regard to the name of the Chevy Chase Fountain, Chevy Chase Circle Fountain. And uh, so during that period, when we get to it, we'll ask for anyone who, who is interested in, in speaking to identify themselves. And then uh, we'll probably have so many at that point that we'll have to limit the time for each person uh, to, to three minutes. And so we'll uh, let you know when the three minutes are up and when we need to go on to a, another person. Um, the meeting is being recorded as are all of our ANC meetings. And uh, so just to let all of you, all of you know, um, and they'll be posted on uh, the ANC's YouTube page uh, probably tomorrow morning. Okay, the first thing we need to do is adopt our agenda. Uh, the agenda has been posted on our website and on the various listservs in the that serve the neighborhood. Uh, are there any modifications or changes anyone wants to make to the agenda? Okay, will all those in favor of adopting the agenda indicate by saying aye, aye. Raising your hand. That's good. Okay, five zero. Of the agenda is adopted. Excuse me, Randy. Yes. Just, hey. Um, I think if, if all the commissioners could put themselves on mute, I'm getting a decent amount of feedback, and I don't know if it's just coming from folks, but I think if we could all just be on mute when we're not speaking, that would be be best. Okay, is that any better, Abe? I I, I apologize. I've got, my, our air conditioning has gone out, and I've got a fan. Uh, so that I can survive through this uh, without sweating too much. Uh, but if that becomes a problem, let me know. Please keep your fan on. <laughs> I will have to. That's not an option. Um, there are a couple of announcements that I have first um, before we get to any other substantive business. Um, the, the two announcements uh, relate to the election, and that's uh, coming up faster than we will imagine, I think. Um, but the, the Board of Elections met with us last week, uh, Chair Bennett and uh, Alice Miller, who's the Executive Director, and they foreshadowed the, what the, the board was going to do uh, in terms of sending out a mail-in ballots to every registered voter. And in fact, that's what the board approved on July 17th. And they also approved the use of at least 40 uh, in-person voting sites around the city. The first step in that process is going to be a card, a postcard that the Board of Elections is going to be sending to every registered voter just to verify their uh, address. And so all registered voters should, beginning in the first week in August, uh, they should begin receiving those postcards. And please pay attention to them, don't throw them out. Uh, look at them and make sure that your information, of your voter information is exactly correct. Uh, you can even get ahead of that process by going online to the Board of Elections uh, website, and we'll have the link in our minutes. Um, but there you can check your voter registration information. And if it's incorrect in any way, then you can correct it with a, another link that is on that same website. So we encourage you to go ahead and do that promptly. Uh, even before you get the card, you can go ahead and make sure your voter registration information is correct. Um, if you do have to make a change, it's a little bit of a, an involved process. You have to print out the form, then you have to sign it and scan it and then send it, uh, either scan it and send it as an email or mail it 
to the Board of Elections. Uh, unfortunately, you can't do that entirely online. It does require a physical signature. Uh, the other last thing I will mention about the Board of Elections is they are still looking for election workers. And there's a uh, place on <clears throat> the Board of Elections website <clears throat> that has information on um, working in the election and uh, an application form that you can fill out. Uh, <clears throat> the second uh, announcement has also to do with the election, and that is we're coming up to the deadline for submitting uh, petitions to get on the ballot as an ANC commissioner uh, for the November election. And all seven of the uh, commissioner's positions are up for election. Anyone who has lived in a single member district for at least 60 days uh, can um, uh, get, the, get on the ballot and be uh, considered as an, a candidate in the November election. Uh, the deadline, however, is August 5th at 5 p.m. And you have to first get your petitions from the Board of Elections. And there's a website that will be on our um, minute, in our minutes where you can uh, get that. It's uh, on the, under the Board of Elections website under candidates and the candidate ballot access information link will get you there. And you only need 10 signatures on petitions. And so it's a, an opportunity for anyone who's interested in becoming an ANC commissioner to, to run and be on the ballot in November. Uh, the final announcement I have is uh, the Second District Metropolitan Police uh, Citizens Advisory Council will meet virtually on August 11th at 7 p.m. And if you wish to attend, you should contact Samantha Nolan at nolantutor at gmail.com and she will send you the Zoom link for that meeting. Okay, that's all the announcements I have. Uh, Abe, do you have any announcements? I do not. Chris? Jerry? Jerry, any announcements? Shanda? No announcements. Okay. The announcements from the mayor's office and from any of the council members' offices will be in our minutes as well. Uh, just in order to save time, we've uh, asked them to submit those in, in advance. Okay, the first item on our agenda is, as we've been doing for the last several meetings, uh, Jerry Mallets, who's been keeping up with this very, very carefully, uh, has updated us on the coronavirus emergency impacts and how they that has affected our neighborhood particularly. And so Jerry, you want to do that uh, uh, as a first item on the agenda? Sure, thanks Randy. Uh, well, first I have some, some good news about our, our business district. Uh, basically every business that we have is now open except for the three that have closed, uh, Catch Can, uh, Periwinkle, and um, Joe's Barbershop, those are all, all closed for good, uh, for different reasons. Uh, two insurance company offices are still closed, uh, Allstate and State Farm, and two restaurants are, are closed, um, Macon and Capital Crab. And, and one thing I'd like to, to add that we haven't talked about before, Harmonic Music Studios, they're going to stay closed through the summer and start enrollment for virtual online classes in the middle of August. So other than those few that I just mentioned, everything else is, is open in some form or fashion, but uh, it's not just virtual open, the businesses themselves are open. So hopefully that will remain the case and uh, you know, we'll, we'll stay positive with, with our business district. Uh, the thing that, that leads into that is, as we all know, the pandemic is still here. Uh, when we last met, I gave some numbers that were more optimistic than I'm able to, to give today because we've had uh, quite the uptick in the last uh, couple of weeks where our five-day rolling average was down in the upper 30s. Uh, it was as high as 83 a few days ago. It's now 66, our five-day rolling average. And the number of patients we have in DC hospitals uh, due to the virus 
had the largest one day increase in over a month from yesterday to today, went from 85 to 102. So um, we still have to be very careful about all of these things. So given that, uh, one thing that I, I recently did was um, we hear about the positivity rate of uh, infections to the number of tests that have been taken. The goal is almost across the country to get down below five. DC as a whole is at 6.8. But that varies greatly by ward. So I just wanted to, to point that out. Uh, it goes from a low of 3.3 in a ward to a high of 11.4 in another ward. And the interesting thing about that is R, A, and C is split between wards three and four. And the numbers I just gave, the 3.3 is ward three and the 11.4 infection rate is ward four. So um, we're neighbors. Uh, we need to look out for each other and hopefully we'll be able to drive those those numbers down and the other um, interesting aspect of that dc also publishes in two different tables uh, neighborhoods there are about 40 neighborhoods they publish uh, tests taken and positive tests so i put them together uh, and i came up with infection rates for each neighborhood and there too uh, and i'm just tracking the ones that are adjacent to, to where we live uh, in this community. And here too, they go from a low of uh, 1.5, which is Barnaby Woods, to a high of 15.5 in Brightwood. So um, there's great differences. Um, we have to be very careful about, you know, just when we go someplace, when people come here, uh, when we travel out of the state, because today DC published a list of 27 states that uh, people coming from those states are now under a self quarantine uh, mandate for 14 days. And one of those states happens to be Delaware. And so if you go to the Eastern shore and you go to Dewey Beach or Rehoboth, for instance, and you come back into DC, by this new mandate, you're supposed to self-quarantine for 14 days. And of course, the enforcement of these things is next to impossible, but that's still the goal. And the goal is that way because of um, the increase in uh, positive test results and that we still have uh, neighborhoods that um, we, we need to be very vigilant in keeping all the neighborhoods in DC safe, not just talking about uh, Chevy Chase, Hawthorne, and Barnaby Woods, but all our neighborhoods across DC. So that's um, a brief, you know, overview of both our neighborhood and and what's going on, uh, you know, throughout DC. Thanks, Jerry. Any questions from commissioners? Any questions we've gotten on the Q and A, No. Thanks. No, I, I think the only thing I would add is just coronavirus.dc.gov. If you haven't visited, that's where all the data that is publicly available pretty much is is listed. It's really useful. Okay. Um, anything else? We'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, Uh, the next item is a presentation on the on DDOT's work on Oregon Avenue on the rehabilitation project, which is coming along quite well. Uh, Abe, you want to take that? Sure. Um, so Jam Kendrick is here from uh, the Oregon Avenue project team, and I'm going to make her a panelist right now, and she's going to provide us an update on that uh, that project. So the reconstruction began last December and it's continued through the pro through the pandemic. And this is a reconstruction of Oregon Avenue from Military Road all the way north to Western Avenue um, in three different phases. And phase one from Beach Street, where I live, up to Western is nearing completion. And phase two, that will be from Military to Rittenhouse, is, ex is expected to begin soon. So 
Um, we'd like to hear from Jam. And Jam, do you have anyone else with you tonight? Yes, uh, Peyton Manning is on. Peyton Manning. And Got I believe it. Joe Chikwecki. Joe. I don't see anyone. I don't see any Josephs, or I don't see anyone with that name on. Is it possible he's calling in via, via phone? Could be, very much so. Okay, I see a few phone numbers, but if um, if he could either text you or you could, or he could text Peyton and let us know what his phone number is, then we can promote him and get him part of the conversation too. Okay, um, I can do that. And his phone number is 856, that's the area code. Yeah, I don't see anyone with that on the list right now. Okay, okay, no problem. Well, Peyton is here and he can fill in any gaps that I may have. How about Oregon Avenue, huh? Yeah, it's almost done. At least this phase is almost phase done. Phase one is almost but done. That's, that's big. Yeah, so tell us, tell us um, how, what, what has happened during phase one, because I think a lot of people right now can see that there's a lot of activity there, but it may not always be clear what, what is actually happening. So um, let me switch over to Peyton because he has a bird's eye view of Oregon Avenue and can give you some uh, up close and personal details. I think his... Hey everybody, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Yeah, so right now uh, the process is we're working on the sidewalks. Uh, I don't know if anybody's been over that way to see the update. Um, for the most part, along from that stretch from beach to western, the sidewalks have been installed, and then we're finishing up the last bit of uh, roadway paving, which from right now, uh, from western to birch is done, and then we're going to do birch to beach starting tomorrow. And once we finish that last stretch of paving that the uh, south side of the roadway, we will go back over and repave the whole road so it's all nice and even and remove the barriers and open it up and move on to phase two. Really uh, quickly, um, uh, Joe is on, he's, his area code is 202-550-6675. Okay, he's able to talk now. Joe, we can hear you if you talk. Thank you. Uh, Peyton, you hey, finished? Yeah, go on, Joe. Okay. Um, good evening, all. We are planning to move over to phase two. However, in the process of moving to phase two, there are still a little work that still needs to be done on phase one, which is landscaping work once we finish the major construction. The final overlay of phase one will still not be done until we finish all the interfacing and gardening as well as planting the bioswell. As everyone is away, the rain that came last week gave us a little setback on the time we wanted to move over to phase two. However, we are working hard to gain some time. So moving to phase two, setting up all the MOT, we are looking forward to start that in August the 4th. Hopefully the rain will not set us back on it. So it's all weather dependent. If everything goes well, by August the 4th, we will start setting up and um, uh, taking over the um, not bound of the road from military to written house so we can start uh, utility work as well as uh, phase uh, two. And um, that is very much what I wanted to bring to your attention today. Okay, and I'll just jump back in really quickly to say that we've um, had the pleasure of working with the residents down on, in the phase one uh, section. And it has been a, a great uh, community effort and partnership working with 
our residents there and we're looking forward to moving on to phase two. We will still be in the community. My numbers and contact information is still the same. Uh, we provide that information in our newsletter as well. And uh, so it, it's been a very, um, I, I, I'm actually saying a well-oiled machine, this process um, moving through phase one. I, I can't think of too many hiccups that we've had. And we've just uh, had a great uh, experience working with the community here. That's, that's great to hear. Um, if anyone from the community, I see there are 43 people here, maybe that includes us, 36 attendees on. Um, if any of them have a question, please put it in the Q&A function and we'll do our best to pass it on or answer it ourselves. I think I heard you say, Joe, that August 4th is the planned start date for phase two and that you're planning to start with the northbound lane of Oregon from military to Rittenhouse, which would mean that the southbound lane it would still be open, but the northbound lane would be closed beginning August 4th. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Just like we did from beach to western, we started from northbound and then walk our way to the southbound. The same protocol, yes. Got it, got it. Okay, well, that's really helpful. Um, I don't have any, any other questions right now. Um, if other commissioners do, I uh, see Randy, you're unmuted. So, Randy, do you have a question? I, I do. Um, that phase two is going to affect St. John's College High School. And what are the arrangements that you're making to make, make sure there's access uh, to St. John's College High School uh, throughout that period? And the thing I'm particularly concerned about is that's likely to be one of the polling stations for the general election in November. And so we, we need to make sure that we're gonna have access, uh, not only for whatever students are going to be at, at St. John's, and I don't know whether they're gonna have classes uh, in person or not, but uh, certainly need to be able to, to let voters get to that polling place uh, in November and, and the week before uh, the election as well, because early voting will be there as well. Sure, we will definitely make sure that there is access, especially during the election time. And uh, we will be liaisoning with the St. John School to make sure that whatever MOT will put up there, that they are comfortable with it before we finalize it. So, so am I correct then that during that period when you're working on the north or where the northbound lane is open and you're working on the southbound lane. Uh, is that going to be the first step or is it, did I get it backwards? I'm not sure now. Are you going to work first on the northbound side or the southbound side? First, we're going to be working on the uh, national park side, the northbound. All right. Yes. Okay, so anyone wanting to come to St. John's is going to have to come from the north back down. They won't be able to turn at Military Road onto um, Oregon Avenue. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. They, they, have, they, they have access to the Nebraska Avenue and right. um, they can be able to make a left on Oregon driving south and they can enter to St. John's. Right, but I just wanna make sure that we, we uh, advise everyone of the, the route that they're going to have to take to get to St. John's. And again, this, there are gonna be a lot of people who are unfamiliar with having to drive that way to get to St. John's to vote, for instance. So we, we need to make sure that there's ample uh, signage, detours, telling people where to go to get to St. John's. You're definitely right. Before even we start closing up things, all that detour sign will be in place that will show them the military road uh, into 27th Street, Northwest, up to Utah Avenue, and then make a right to Nebraska, and then they will come down to Oregon Avenue to join the Oregon 
and then land on St. John. That, that sounds good. Thank you. Thank and you. I do want to say that we are preparing a deliverable. In, in, in essence, it's our slide presentation, the phase two version, which we would have shown in the kickoff meeting for phase two. But uh, we, we're going to put that into print and we'll deliver it to our stakeholders as well. And it'll be on the website. And it'll also have the detour routes. It'll also have um, information on our um, MOT. So th those details will be included. And um, probably as it gets closer to election time, we may do a distribution as well. That's what everyone is aware. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Donna, do you have a question? Oh, I only wanted to mention in Knollwood, I know you're doing great, and thus far, thank you for the presentation and doing um, you know, this outreach to us. But I just wanted to, I, I know um, no, my, our Knollwood constituents would not let us um, forget that they're there. And I wanted to make sure in, in terms of the project that you all are still communicating with the residents of that um, facility as well, as well as the administration to ensure um, if there are any issues with the detour signs or the traffic congestion and things like that. Yes, actually we are, and we will be in constant communication. Uh, we know that they have, uh, we, we need to make access for their shuttle so we've been in contact with them and definitely they'll be prepared. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that all right? Um, I don't have any other questions. Looks like no other commissioners have other questions and I don't see any questions in the Q&A from participants. So I think we're gonna move on if that's all right. Well, thank Without you. Without objection. Yeah, thank you, Jim, Peyton, and Joe. We, we really appreciate your keeping us informed and all the work yes, that you're you. doing to get the project done too. We're gonna, we're looking forward to eventually being able to go all the way from Military Road to Western Avenue on Oregon Avenue. We are too, and so we thank you for having us. And uh, feel free to contact me should you have any additional questions. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Uh, the next right. item on the agenda is a proposed uh, change in the location for the Capital Bike Share Station that had we had, we had originally approved uh, at Lafayette Elementary School. And uh, they're now, because of a variety of reasons, uh, proposing to change that. Uh, and Jerry, you have uh, all the information about that. You want to begin that discussion? Sure. Um, well, first, uh, Abe, the person that will be speaking is Greg Midleski, so you could let him in. I see he's on the list already. So uh, as, as Randy said, we had approved based on a number of factors, including a petition that was signed by about 200 people um, to install a capital bike share at the current location of where the uh, farmer's market is at Lafayette Elementary School because of the uh, coronavirus and the need for farmers markets to have uh, more distancing than they previously did. It was no longer possible to put the bike share there and um, allow the, the vendors from the farmers market to uh, operate the way that they, they need to uh, during this pandemic. So uh, Greg, who I see now is on, on video, uh, and has, we've spoken and uh, one of the options that they were looking at is putting that bike share instead of uh, where it was originally going to be at the farmer's market to put it on uh, Northampton on the street. So I'll let him explain how that, that works and uh, I'm sure we'll have a few questions afterwards. So it's all yours, Greg. All right, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, uh, everyone else, for having me on tonight. Um, I had a, a just a brief presentation that just shows you where we were thinking of putting the station. Is it is it possible for me to present, or is that outside the scope of this? And if it is, no worries. I can 
I can talk about it. Um, but basically, as, as the commissioner mentioned, um, yeah, we had additionally, or we had originally planned to have the station. Can he share a screen? Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, where'd it go? Um, doesn't look like I can, or at least I'm not seeing it. Um, but that's no worries. It was just like literally two pictures. Um, and I, I can share them with the rest of the commission. But basically, we were supposed to put it in that little courtyard uh, right at, at Lafayette Elementary School. Um, we were all set to install it, um, but then COVID hit. Um, and at the request of the farmer's market, um, you know, due to the social distancing uh, and the need to space out the tables and the patrons, um, that location is sort of not feasible for the time being. Um, but from what we've heard from members of the community is that they do want bike share in the area. And so uh, we looked at a potential in-street location on the southwest corner of Northampton Street and Broad Branch Road Northwest, um, right outside the Broad Branch Market. Um, basically what we would do is we would, I think the area right now, people, people park their, their cars there and the station would be 19, 19 docks, space for 19 um, bicycles. Um, and it would take up about two to three of those parking spaces. Um, it would be situated at the corner, so it would ensure that, uh, you know, there's, there's proper sight lines for people um, attempting to cross the street. Um, and people would pull their bikes uh, towards the middle of the street. We would put up these little plastic flex posts to allow uh, for greater visibility um, of the station. And, you know, we, we've determined that the street uh, is not traffic enough, that we have any concerns with any traffic safety. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we think this is the best way to get a station in as, as sooner rather than later because we have no idea when COVID is going to end, when it will be a, a problem, or when it will cease being a problem. So we know that there are transportation challenges and needs in the neighborhood. So we would like to try to, to, to solve those while we can. Um, can I, I ask questions? <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, my, my first question is, uh, are there other locations throughout DC that have these in-street in -street stations? And if so, uh, how have they been operating? Yes, so we have, I, I don't have a, an exact number of how many stations we have on street, but I would say probably about 15 to 20% of our stations are on streets. Um, we have them all over the District of Columbia and, and you know, other locations in the DMV area. Um, and they, they operate, you know, fantastically. Um, you know, again, these are on low traffic streets. So, you know, we're not putting these on something like Connecticut Avenue or something where it would be sort of dangerous, um, where people would feel comfortable being able to, to, you know, walk into the street to rent a bicycle. Um, those flex posts uh, do a lot to uh, delineate the space uh, for drivers. Um, and we, we've had no safety issues at any of these locations so far in terms of, of vehicle, bicycle, platform. Uh, I'll ask another question until somebody else uh, feels like doing so. Would these be um, regular bikes or electric bikes that you, you would plan to put there? Yeah, so this is this what uh, the station will be able to accommodate both. Um, as, as you have probably seen, Capital Bikes Show reintroduced uh, e-bikes back to our fleet uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and this station would be able to support both. Uh, so you would have the classic acoustic bikes, you know, the red bikes, and then space for the e-bikes. The e there is a question from our participants, but I think we typically have commissioners ask questions first, so I don't want to cut anyone off. I've got one question. Yes. Uh, I know that there's been some talk about the possibility of having, of designating that block Northampton Street as a slow street. Uh, will that, I, I assume that would uh, enhance the uh, desirability of having that uh, bike share station in the street there if it, if it were designated as a slow street. For sure, yes, that would definitely increase the attractability and the attractiveness of the station itself. And for folks that are unaware, uh, apologies if you guys spoke about this before, but slow streets are something that DOT is rolling out. Um, to reduce um, traffic through, um, you know, cut through traffic on several streets uh, due to the COVID-19 virus. Uh, so a lot of people to spread out, walk and play in the streets, slow traffic to local traffic only and reducing speeds to 15 miles an hour. Um, so that would, that would certainly improve the situation um, immensely and make people feel more comfortable to cycle. Okay, thanks Greg. 
And when, when you had your engineer out there, did, did they see any issues that uh, you might have to deal with specially? Uh, in terms of like uh, traffic safety or anything, um, fortunately, no. Um, so Northampton Street, as, as you all are aware, it, it sort of dead ends, I guess, um, one block to the west at Nevada Avenue. Um, so it's not really fast cut through traffic because there is that sort of natural um, thing that slows them down at the end there. Um, and of course, being by the school, I think we have a raised crosswalk on Broad Branch Road or maybe on the other side of Northampton. So, I mean, it's a stop controlled intersection. There's already a, a sort of a speed bump there um, to get people to slow down. So we, we had no concerns from our traffic engineers or from our contracted operators about the, uh, the safety or the well-being of the station and the people that use it. I, I assume there's also no problem with the uh, uh, solar panels to, um, to provide energy to the station as well. There, there's Correct. some feedback there, but I assume it's not going to be sufficient to, to, to uh, uh, really hurt, hurt that uh, um, recharging process. That is correct. Yeah. So one of the things that our, our operators look for is that solar access. Unfortunately, there is enough um, during the day at this location to, to power the stations. And for folks that are unaware, Capital Bike Share stations are entirely solar powered. So we don't even have to like tap in or like break ground on the street to tap into any power lines. We're, we're powered by the sun. And um, yeah, we're, our engineers checked it out and it works for them. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, being that uh, that location is a very residential neighborhood, I'm hoping you're not planning on having illuminated advertisements at this station. Oh, yes, uh, not at all. So, um, so Capital Black Share, we do have uh, advertisements on our map panels at the end, but they are not lit in any way. Um, they're, they're just standard. Um, and yeah, no, no concerns. Uh, or th there will not be any illumination. I can tell you that. Good. Excellent. Um, two questions from the uh, participants. Um, how large is the bike share? Where does it begin and how far is it from the crosswalk? If you can tell us more about that. Gotcha. Okay, so the station itself, as I mentioned before, is 19 docks. And so that's our standard station size. And that, that clocks in at about 52 linear feet long by about six feet wide. Um, and so we would offset that by the curb from the curb by about a foot to allow for proper drainage. So that the total footprint would be about seven feet by 52 feet. Um, it would be located about five or 10 feet away from the crosswalk, um, you know, whatever the minimum is for our, our engineering standards. Um, I'm sorry, did I, I probably forgot another question. What was it? <laughs> no, you got it. Where does it begin? How long is it? How far from the crosswalk? Um, and then could it be relocated to the farmer's market potentially if distancing restrictions I should say when distancing restrictions are relaxed. <laughs> yes, so Capital Bike Share stations, um, you, since they are solar powered and we don't have to tap in anything, they're fully modular. We just put them down uh, super easy and we can just as easily pick it back up and move it somewhere else. So if, if when COVID um, you know, ceases to be an issue and the farmer's market you know, goes back to its, its uh, old ways, if, if, we would, if there is a desire to move the station, we can do so very easily. Um, Abe, I was just wondering, and Randy, uh, the owner of Broad Branch, Tracy, was the one that asked that first question, and she's on this call. Could we just uh, permit her to, since it is her business that would be most directly impacted, um, if she has any follow-up question, can she just ask it uh, so we can all hear it? Randy, would you like me to promote her to, to speak? Sure, absolutely. Okay. It's T.S. Right. Standard. Tracy, we can hear you if you're off mute. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, if you could speak a little louder. Sure. How are you? Thank you. Yeah, my um, question. You know, as, as I said in writing, where the uh, my concerns are the length of the dock. Um, as I walk it um, from the crosswalk, if I walk off about 50 feet, it's almost the entire length of our building. Um, 
which means that I lose all access to the street there on that side. My concerns are trash removal, which is on that side of the, the, the building. Also, my fire stanchion is on that side of the building. Um, turn myself up. Sorry, um, I, I think I missed the first question. You said that, um, or the, the first comments. So you said that the station would be the can length of- Can you hear me of... better now? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, sorry, I had to turn my mic up. No, as I walked it, it's about the whole length of our building. And so on that side of our building on Northampton is where our trash room is. And we have commercial trash pickup um, almost every day of the week. Um, and it goes out that side and across the sidewalk. Um, and then my other concern is our fire stanchion is on that side of the building. So like, how do, how do buildings, I mean, in other buildings, do you have restrictions for fire access? Because I just can't see you blocking the whole street there. Yes, so uh, I guess I'll, I'll tackle that question first about the fire access. Um, yeah, so we do have, we do have um, limitations and requirements of, of distancing from you know, fire hydrants or fire stanchions or stand pipes. Um, but these, uh, the, the, the station itself is rather porous. I wish I, wish I could put a, a photo in the, I could show you a photo here, but. Oh, I've, I've tried to walk through them. <laughs> okay, yeah, so there's, there's um, you know, we have not had any concerns from fire EMS um, on access to the fire hydrants. You know, we just, as long as we stay clear, um, I think our minimum is like five feet from a fire hydrant, and then I think like 10 feet from a stanchion or a standpipe. Mm -hmm. I think um, oh so that that I, I would not say there's any concern with that um, as far as trash access um, you know we're happy to accommodate that in any way possible you know we can ship the station you know a little further from uh, a little further up or I guess a little further away from the uh, from the crosswalk if that would uh, permit trash access because we we understand it's a concern and, and that comes up from time to time um, I guess yeah, yeah. I just can't okay. I mean, I, I, can't have my, I can't have the trash guys dragging the toters into the crosswalk and I can't really have them dragging it across the tree box in front of my neighbor's house below, you know. Um, is there a way to split the bike rack in the middle? So there's, an, there's like a five foot opening in the middle? Can you put like two banks of them? Uh, unfortunately, we cannot. Um, if, if, I could, if I may pose a question. Um, so I, I know that there is, there's currently parking there today, or mm -hmm. at least I, I believe so. Uh, what what is the the status quo with with trash pickup if there are if there are oh, cars? Yeah, they, they squeeze between the cars that are parked there, you know. So okay. I mean, generally they'll find a space between any cars that are parked there, and they double park. The trash truck double parks, so the trash truck basically closes the road. You know, because there's parking you... on both sides. If, gotcha. if I could interject, can you can you disable some of the places to park the bike so that it's easier to get through? Unfortunately, no. Um, oh. There are some, in other systems, yes, but we found that those, those things don't work. Um, so the civil instructors, no, unfortunately we cannot. Um, but you know, we're, able, we're happy to shift the station, uh, you know, up or down a couple feet if that would, if that would allow for trash access. Um, Cause we don't, we don't want to impact um, the neighborhood too much. We understand that that's a concern. Um, so we're happy to accommodate that. Yeah, tra trash is a big deal. <laughs> um, yeah. Can you meet me out there <laughs> so I can show you? Um, the, uh, I, I can't promise that because uh, it's kind of far. From <laughs> me. Um, I, I guess I could talk, I could chat offline um, with that just to get a sense of, you know, like you said it happens every day, but, um, you know, like the volume of pickup, you know, is it like, is it two sort of trash bins? Is it like 20, you know, so and so? Um, you know, it's, you know, eight. I, I think this probably is, is I think this yeah, probably is. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be better to talk offline about the, the, the specifics of this, but, uh, and we do need to go on to another item, but uh, I would suggest that maybe we could, I, I think we need, do need to vote on this. Do you agree with that, Jerry? And, you know, we can vote on it with a proviso that uh, this be worked out with Broad Branch Market so that uh, it's, it's gonna be a, an acceptable positioning for them. Um, but I think, I think we do need to go ahead and, and uh, address the issue and move on. So Jerry, you wanna offer a motion? Sure, I'd like to uh, 
I'm sure I'll not say this properly, but I'd like to move that we uh, accept the proposal to install the capital bike share at the proposed location with the proviso that uh, Greg and Tracy communicate and that it's a, an acceptable solution for the trash pickup, uh, Tracy. And it also has to be acceptable to the person next door, because I think if you shift the station down, you're going to be in front of the house. Oh, so. Well, I would assume, Greg, that you do not put stations in front of people's houses. Uh, not, not frequently. Some people do ask for them. Uh, we do have stations in front of houses, um, but yeah, we would be sensitive to the concerns of the neighbors. But you wouldn't do that without somebody's permission, I would guess. Correct. For something like this, I think we would, we would seek the approval of the, okay. the adjacent property owner. So with those two provisos, I, I move that we uh, accept the relocation of the pipe share. Second. I just have a question uh, before we vote. Let, let's do have a discussion of it first. Aim. Yeah. Um, Greg, your email is greg.mitleski at, at dc.gov. That is correct. I can put that. Okay. In the... I got it. I, I see your name. I'm just going to, there's a few questions in the chat that we're not going to get to. And I want to make sure people have your email so they can follow up with you if they want to ask you directly. Um, I'm good. hesitant to support this just because that's a quite a, just, I want to make sure Tracy and the, Broad branch market isn't unduly impacted, and just that there would be some communication between Greg and Tracy doesn't seem like enough. And um, I'm also not 100% convinced that this is the absolute best location. Um, it could be moved down, but there's a question in the chat about moving it to a different spot on Broad Branch, which we really don't have time to talk about today. So I don't really feel comfortable supporting this as it is right now. Well, one thing about Broad Branch, you can't go on Broad Branch. That's a uh a narrow street and that's a bus route so uh, impossible to go on broad branch how about the other side of northampton that's not a, not the broad branch market side but the opposite side is that a possibility that's a school drop off and pick up oh well no i this is on northampton on right. the the west side of broad right. branch that's not school drop off is it it is oh really well, residential also yeah yeah, it is residential there. You're right. Um, okay, well, uh, is there any other discussion? Shanda, you have any? Yeah, I'm just comments? wondering if we could add a caveat into the resolution and say that an, an acceptable location that's close to the school that doesn't interfere with the drop offs and other things. Is that something that's possible? I'm beginning to think maybe uh, this is a little bit premature and maybe we ought to wait and do it at a later meeting. Jerry, what do you think about that? Uh, well, a uh, later meeting or next one is September 14th, so that's now. Uh, yeah. I know this is this was something that was approved. So I, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, you know, how much bikes are being used right now. Uh, Greg, I could ask you that question. Are capital bike shares being used more often or less often right now? Yeah, so it's it's not as high as it was, you know, pre-COVID because, you know, people aren't really commuting to you from work at the same level, but our usage has been high um, because people are finding, you know, to be around and get some fresh air and also get to where they need to go uh, without using public transportation or, with, you know, going on the metro or, or a bus. I, I'm, you know, if I know that Greg uh, has looked at many locations around that area, both on Northampton, on the backside of the school, uh, on the, the sidewalk, in, in pretty much every place. And this was uh, what he recommended as the, the best location. If people don't feel comfortable with it yet. Um, I'm not going to, to force a vote, but uh, it is something that I think uh, we need to be prepared to vote on in the next meeting on September 14th. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, but I do think maybe it needs a little bit more work before we can confidently say that this is uh, something that, that is gonna be beneficial for the community. And it sounds like from Greg, what Greg just said, that maybe uh, it's not as urgent right now 
Uh, I know one of the reasons that we had thought about this location in first instance was that it would give a lot more people access to uh, Lafayette Elementary. We don't know yet whether the school is going to be operating in person or not. Uh, and so I think maybe it is just a little pre premature. And I don't see the urgency right now for a, our, our going ahead with it. Um, That's an excellent point about Lafayette probably not having uh, classes. Yeah. So I, I would I would suggest that we, we table the motion and that we revisit it at our September 14th meeting. Is that okay with everyone? Um, and in the meantime, uh, I recommend that uh, Greg or his surrogates get together with Tracy yeah. to look at some of those issues. That well, and also I, I do see on the, the Q&A that there are a couple of questions about um, access as well with the school. Uh, and I just think we need a little bit more information and maybe uh, the other questions can be answered. Greg can help answer those questions as well over the next few weeks. Okay, Greg, is that all right with you? Yeah, that, that works for us. Uh, works okay. for us. Um, yeah, happy to, to work with the community. Okay, we, we appreciate that. Thank you very much, Greg. Okay, thanks, Greg. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for having me. Okay, and next, next item on the agenda is uh, the one everyone's been waiting for, um, the resolution uh, regarding the name of the Chevy Circle Fountain. Uh, and obviously this has gotten a lot of attention uh, in the community. A lot of people have expressed opinions on the various listservs. Uh, Shanda has been working closely on developing a resolution on this issue, and so I'm going to turn it over to Shanda. Thanks, Randy. Um, at the outset, before we start the discussion, I would just like to thank you and our my fellow commissioners for actually actively working to do research and gather background and input from the community on this issue. So this truly, just because I'm presenting it tonight does not mean that it was not a joint effort amongst many of the commissioners to gather information because as most people know, our commission, before we bring resolutions and before we think, bring things to the community, we like to have information and basically know what we're talking about. So thank you all for that. Um, and I'd also like to just briefly take part of this resolution time to bring it forth in honor of Congressman John Lewis, who, as you know, is a congressman and former civil rights leader who um, fought for equal rights for African Americans and all citizens. And tonight, he lies in state in our capital rotunda. Um, and I just want to honor and remember his legacy as we go forth in all our discussions. And so let me say at the outset that um, before the resolution discussion that I believe as a commissioner that Chevy Chase, like all communities across this country, is a community full of promise. We are full of good, honest, hardworking people who want a better way of life and we want an equitable place to live. Our community represents a vibrant life in the nation's capital and we're a gateway to, as I said, to the capital. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I moved here 10 years ago. Um, but however, um, looking at our history, and as many residents have pointed out, I would not have been able to live here long ago um, because of discriminatory housing practices and other issues um, in our country. Fortunately, now, um, our community, um, in the words of John Lewis, we know better. So we must fight for change and we must do better. So this resolution to remove, uh, meaning to lift the plaque out of the grounds and um, near the fountain um, is a part of that conversation and debate that we're currently having. Um, for some of us, it may be uncomfortable, but it is something that I think we can all be respectful and open and openly talk about. So it's in that stead that I bring the resolution. Um, to give you background, this issue was before our ANC in 2014 when former commissioner Gary Thompson, um, after residents um, alerted him to the issue, historical articles um, presented it to the ANC. Um, at that time, it was tabled and it was decided to be looked at it at an, a later date. 
Uh, since that time, as you know, there have been petitions by groups such as change.org um, with over 2,000 signatures in the community and other residents who have asked our ANC to look into this issue, um, which we have done. And because of this, and because of our belief that we as a community have no room for any vestiges and or symbols of discrimination, segregation, or racial injustice, that we as an ANC are now taking the lead both for the future of our children and our community. Um, and I know that uh, we all um, want to go forth in our nation and have a positive history. So this is just one of the steps um, in doing that. Um, I know we'll have many individuals who want to speak tonight on the resolution. As a part of our commission's in-depth research, we actually uh, located um, an author, Dr. William R Rowley, who's cited in our resolution and who's actually a historian out of the University of Nevada and who's done extensive research on um, the past of Francis G. Newlands, who unfortunately, although he was um, a recognized businessman in the community and a member of Congress at one point, has through his speeches, writings, and actions um, surfaced as a divisive individual who used um, racist language, to be frank, um, to divide our community. So it's with that that I turn it back over to Randy or um, Abe, I guess, to at least recognize, I guess, or to begin our discussion. I, Randy, is that how you want to proceed? Sure. Um, and I think maybe we might want to hear first from the National Park Service. Uh, we know they're uh, represented here tonight. And Abe, you want to recognize uh, Julia? Sure. Julia Washburn um, is the superintendent of Rock Creek Park. And Julia, remind me who you're here with again. Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. I brought my colleague, uh, Brad Kruger. Um, Brad is the Rock Creek Park uh, Cultural Resources Specialist. Um, so he, he's in charge of the management and care of all of our memorials, monuments, statues, etc. cetera. Um, so, so uh, maybe, uh, yeah. Maybe you can just give us a, a brief background on uh, the National Park Service's role in all of this and um, how, what, what is feasible from the Park Service's standpoint. Right, well, like you have been investigating this, um, so have we, and um, at every turn, we find out something new um, and it continues to be complex, um, but it's fascinating as well. Um, so Chevy Chase Circle is a federal property, but it's managed by the National Park Service. And it was established as a memorial through an act of Congress. Um, so in, a sen in essence, the people of the United States through Congress chose to make it a memorial. So um, I've actually asked Brad, who knows a lot more about the ins and outs of this than I, to give you a brief background of a little bit of the history, and then also to talk about the various hoops we uh, would need to jump over should um, the people decide that it needs to be changed. So Brad, are you on? Yes, I am, thank you. Go ahead. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, so as Julia mentioned, the uh, Francis G. Newlands Fountain in Chevy Chase Circle is managed by the National Park Service and has been since 1933. The memorial itself um, was uh, dedicated that year and it was dedicated to Senator Newlands um, because of his uh, history with the Northwest Washington DC area. Um, as many people know, he was a, a real estate developer and founded the Chevy Chase Land Company in the 1890s. Um, what some people don't really know is that he was also a supporter of the Senate Park Commission and was actually instrumental in the establishment of the Commission of Fine Arts. Uh, but it was really his role as a real estate developer, which is why there is a memorial fountain in Chevy Chase today. Um, but as we've heard already this evening, um, Senator Newlands was also a staunch segregationist and a racist. Uh, he advocated for the repeal of the 15th Amendment 
which granted African-American men the right to vote. Uh, he built exclusive white-only neighborhoods, the model of which was adopted all over the country. Uh, he called for limited education for African-American youth, and his company was instrumental in the downfall and eventual raising of Reno City, a neighborhood of primarily African-American residents. So that is just a, a thumbnail uh, sketch of Senator Newlands. Now, we as the federal agency, as the National Park Service, we have this memorial fountain to him. And as Julia made mention, there are some challenges with rededicating this particular memorial. So as a federal agency, we have to abide by federal law, regulations, and agency policy. So I just want to mention three of these to you this evening. Um, the first one is the Commemorative Works Act. And this was established uh, to uh, create a set of processes and criteria that memorials must meet in order to be authorized for placement in DC and its immediate environs. So the Commemorative Works Act was actually passed in 1986. So the fountain itself actually predates the Commemorative Works Act. Um, what is not known, however, is that the bronze plaque that is laid in front of the fountain in the Flagstone Plaza, that was actually installed in 1990 as part of a major rehabilitation and rededication ceremony of the fountain. So we're looking to see if the bronze plaque itself was, has any uh, connection to the congressional authoriz authorization um, that Congress passed, um, or if it was just placed without Congress's authorization. So that's something that bears a little bit more research that we are actively investigating. The other, another element that we're uh, looking into is related to the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Um, and this is the nation's primary historic preservation law. Um, specifically related to section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, this directs federal agencies to take into account the effects of their pro uh, projects and actions on historic properties. And this fountain is considered a historic property because it is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, it's primarily listed in the National Register because of its uh, significance in the area of art as a commemorative fountain, um, not so much for its specific association with Senator Newlands, um, but any alteration or change to the fountain would require us to analyze it under section 106. And then finally, I just wanna make mention of the National Park Service's own management policies. Uh, regarding pre-existing commemorative works, it notes that these works and their inscriptions will not be altered relocated, obscured, or removed, even when they are deemed inaccurate or incompatible with prevailing present day values. Um, now I say this, uh, but I do wanna make the caveat that exceptions to this management policy can be made, um, but it would take um, elevating this decision up to our regional and Washington level offices. Uh, so that is some of the backgrounds that we are currently investigating. Um, you know, as we said earlier, there are challenges with this, but nothing is impossible. Thanks, Brad. And I want to just add one thing to that, which is one thing we are absolutely able to do and are planning to do um, is to add one or two wayside exhibits, which are those low kind of signs that describe the landscape that you see in many national parks, including Rock Creek Park. Um, and so our plan is to work with the community and others of interest to interpret Senator Newland's the history of the fountain. Um, and so we can do that right away, right? In the next couple of months, it would just take the research design and fabrication and installation of wayside exhibits. Um, and we have made the decision that, that we, we do want to proceed to do that. So we can do that regardless of what proceeds um, in terms of what I, I think maybe um, if, 
if the ANC were to make a resolution and ask the Park Service to remove the plaque, it may take us some time to go through all those processes, but we don't have to wait to put up the interpretive information. Uh, thank, thank you, Julie and Brad. We, we really appreciate that. I know you've done a lot of work on this issue and have um, uh, explored all the possibilities. So we really appreciate that. Well, you're uh, welcome, and we're still exploring. <laughs> good, good. And thank we would you. like to work with you as you continue to explore as well. Uh, and, and clearly, this is something that we want to do as expeditiously as we can. Uh, but we also want to make sure it's done right uh, so that we don't get uh, a problem along the way. Um, Shanda, you have anything else to add or Abe? I know Abe's been working on this issue as well. Uh, yes, um, I just want to thank them for, for apprising us of what we can do expeditiously. And I do want to emphasize that we want to continue after tonight um, on the next steps of working with you, both you, Julia, and Brad on this. Um, Randy, at some point during our um, presentation, uh, I know we have Professor Raleigh, so I would like him to be briefly be able to speak on the historical, to give historical context. Sure. I, I, Abe has elevated him to a panelist, and uh, Professor Raleigh, you want to go ahead and speak? Uh, yes. Um, are you hearing me? Or? Yes, we are. Oh, okay. Uh, very good. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm a retired uh, professor from the University of, of Nevada, Reno, and uh, my uh, research took me to uh, uh, Francis Newlands very early in my career here at the university, which started back in, uh, I guess, the late 1960s. I'm uh, quite retired uh, now, but uh, I did publish a book uh, as uh, on Newlands, or a biography on, on Newlands um, in uh, 1996. Uh, and I, and all I can say is that I did come, I was uh, uh, rather distressed actually to find uh, that he had these kind of views uh, uh, in his career that was otherwise quite progressive. Uh, and uh, I, and, and he stood for the modernization of uh, the Western economy, uh, reclamation, bringing uh, water to the deserts through irrigation and federally backed uh, uh, prog uh, 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 projects. Uh, so he was, uh, he was really quite a figure uh, in, um, uh, in Nevada and in Western progressivism. But on the issue of race, he might as well have been a Southern uh, senator. Uh, because he was an old-time 19th century uh, unreconstructed Democrat uh, uh, from the uh, uh, from civil uh, from the uh, Reconstruction period, and of course, I think it's already been mentioned there that he was a staunch supporter of the repeal of the Fifteenth Amendment in the con in the Constitution. He called it poison in the Constitution, actually. So he has some very strong uh, views about this whole issue. He believed that the United States was for white people only uh, and, uh, is, uh, and that the future of America was not multiracial or multicultural. Uh, he, he just simply couldn't wrap his mind around the idea that the future uh, would be multiracial and certainly uh, that uh, black and brown people could participate in the governing uh, of the of the nation, um, and uh, these are well. And and he supports uh, his his writings are are prolific in, on these uh, issues in uh, in in scholarly publications of the day. Not that he's alone, of course, uh, in uh, in this period uh, in advocating uh, these kinds of uh, uh, views. Uh, so. Um, and we are having a similar uh, issue here uh, today uh, uh, in Reno with, the, uh, with a park that is named Newlands Park. There's a protest against it. Uh, and uh, I, quite frankly, I have taken the position that the, the park should be renamed uh, here uh, in, uh, uh, in Reno uh, because it is a civic space and it's simply, the name is simply not uh, in harmony with present day, uh, with present day values. 
uh, and and monuments um, <clears throat> are not really history. They reflect the sentiments of the time in which they're uh, erected. Uh, so uh, I guess that's my position. Any questions on it? Or I, I, I don't know if I've gone through it or not in, it, uh, in uh, the kind of detail that you want, but uh, I know that we want to move on. That, that's perfect. We, we really appreciate that, Professor Rowley. Uh, any other questions from the commissioners? Or Jerry? Yes. Yes. I have uh, two questions. One, I just want to clarify, when you say removal of the plaque, this is for Julia Brandt, when you say removal of the plaque, are you only talking about the bronze plaque or the stone plaque as well? That's my first question. Um, so I'll speak and then if Brad wants to correct me, <laughs> that's fine. Um, so there are two, there are two issues, right? There's the brass plaque, which was put on the ground in 1990 as at the 100th anniversary of the um, Chevy Chase Land Company as a rededication. And then there, and we don't actually know if that came with any legislation or not. If they were following the Commemorative Works Act, they should have had legislation for it. Um, and then the, the stone inscription on the fountain is in two places. There's sort of a sort of a tablet with engraved information on it. And then uh, the Newland's name is engraved around the wall. Yes. Um, and, and so there are, there, there, it makes it even more complicated, right? Um, uh, so A, we need to find out if the brass plaque can be removed because it's not theoretically a contributing resource to the historic landscape there. And also um, we don't know, but we don't think it, it came with its own act of Congress. So those are some unanswered questions we need to figure out. Um, but then with regard to changing the actual face of the fountain, the stonework on the fountain, if we were to try to change that, um, that would be, I think, uh, also um, a sort of escalated issue for the Historic Preservation Office. So that would have to be, a, you know, back and forth with the DC Historic Preservation Office and looking at the compliance with the um, with the Historic Preservation Act. Now, Brad, did I say anything wrong, or do you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, Julia, you are spot on. Um, so, you know, there are the two issues. There's the bronze plaque on the plaza. There's the inscriptions on the fountain itself. So um, we are investigating uh, what it would take to alter um, each of those. But again, NPS management policy currently states that, you know, these works and their inscriptions will not be altered, relocated, obscured, or removed. So um, we are trying to get additional guidance on that from both our regional and Washington level offices, um, and we will continue to do so. And, and I would add that, you know, we will do all, we will continue the investigation and, and we will consult with, um, as Brad mentioned, our regional director. And if, if it comes to this, uh, also with the director of the National Park Service, um, absolutely. And we're happy to do that. Um, so, so the issue is like, to, to what degree do you want to change? Does the community want to change it? And then also, if you were, this, the, the, a more difficult approach, but perhaps ironically the simplest approach is should the community decide they want to change it, actually having uh, Congresswoman Norton introduce a bill in Congress um, and then following that through um, would probably take care of all of it at once, right? If you rededicate the fountain through an act of Congress, it kind of changes it. Well, again, Brad, correct me if I'm wrong, but it kind of over uh, rules the NPS management policies because Congress is making a decision. If the American people established it through an act of Congress back then in the 1930s, 
if the American people in 2020s uh, wanted to change it and it went through Congress, then that I think would overrule um, the NPS management policies. Might not with the Historic Preservation Act, but definitely the management policies. I, I have so, a quick sec. Go ahead, Shonda. No, I was just going to say, um, so, so Julian Barrett Brad, um, if I'm looking at this correctly, we our ANC with our resolution could be the beginning of a perhaps two prong process. One prong looking at the removal of the Pratt plaque and, and, and exhibits next to it and another prong exploring um, perhaps with Congresswoman Norton legislation that may override um, any uh, governmental agency uh, policies. Well, and, and um, if you were to decide to rededicate it to a person or persons, um, you would need an act of Congress to rededicate right, it. Right. But yes, but tonight um, we're not looking at the rededication. Right, and, right, and right. I, I appreciate your information has been a wealth um, and great for us. Um, but I'm just looking at the, the plaque removal piece and the legislative piece at this point. So when you're talking about the plaque removal piece, are you talking about the bronze plaque? Yes, um, I actually, what you mentioned, there are several places. So it would be a combination. I know that when I went over there, there is the bronze plaque that is in the ground physically that you could step on. Then there is also a, I guess, a stone which has an inscription mm -hmm. um, in it. And then the third piece, which you and Brad mentioned, was the word Newlands. Um, my uh, thought with our resolution would be at least the initial step of removing the stone, the in ground plaque, and then working along with you and um, your agency and other entities to look at the greater fountain. I see. Okay. Brad, did you want to clarify anything on that? Uh, no, you, uh, again, hit it uh, right on the head. Um, it would take an act of Congress, though, for any type of uh, rededication of the fountain. Yeah. Would it also take an act of Congress to uh, just strip the name of it without a rededication at this point in time. Yes, because the the fountain was specified by Congress as a memorial specifically, it would take an act of Congress to unmemorialize it, so to speak. Okay. And, and my quick second question, are there any official maps that actually call Chevy Chase Circle Newland's Fountain, Newland's Circle? Does anything exist that you know of, whether it's from NPS or any place else, that's a map or a book with maps in it that calls it Newlands Memorial Fountain? Brad, do you know that answer? Um, I do not have an answer um, off the top of my head. I have never heard of the circle referred to as Newland Circle. Um, and I would have to go back to probably the uh, the enabling legislation for the that Congress passed back in 1932 to see how they designated the fountain. I've always seen it referred to as the Francis G. Newlands Memorial Fountain, but that hasn't that name does not appear on maps, unfortunately. But in Chevy Chase Circle, which is called Chevy Chase Circle, right. It is on the National Registry of Historic Places, though. Correct, yes. It was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 2007. So one last question. In working together, I know we have informally requested meetings with you, and you have met with us through, um, you know, Commissioner Clayman. Um, by our ANC looking at the issue and passing a resolution this evening, um, would that help you to begin a more formalized process of looking at all these issues and assisting us with the best next steps? Um, well, I think that uh, the resolution, um, I think if, if, the, if the ANC passes a resolution to 
you know, begin this process, essentially. Um, you know, that does help us from the point of view of talking to our superiors, et cetera. Um, uh, but, but technically, the ANC can't direct the Park Service to do anything. Um, but what you can say in your resolution is that we resolve to ask the Park Service okay. to do something and to work with us on this. But I can tell you right now, uh, Brad and I and others are, you know, we, be, we want to be responsive to the community and we will continue to explore this and work with you to figure out, you know, what can and can't happen. Um, and, and, and if something can happen, then, then how? Thank you. And our draft resolution that Shanda and others have contributed to, um, emphasizes as well the, the historic exhibit, historical exhibit that would go in the, the circle as well. And that that's something that can be done um, relatively quickly yes. uh, to uh, explain the situation and uh, to indicate that this is not something that reflects uh, current values in this community or in the United States. Well, I don't think we would put on there that it doesn't reflect current values. What the Park Service does is try to interpret the history and put it in context. But, but our, our um, approach is to let the reader or the viewer make up their own mind. So we wouldn't say this doesn't reflect the current values of the community, but we could say something like the, the local ANC passed a resolution to change it, you know, that sort of thing. Right. Um, we like to try to promote multiple points of view. And also, I think one, one, imp one important thing about doing the wayside exhibits, despite whatever anything else happens, is p part of the problem is that it's not revisionist history, it's, it's just history left out. I, I grew up in Ward 3. I went to Woodrow Wilson High School. I had no idea about Reno City or the segregationist history of the city or anything. I mean, so there's a piece of history that we're not sharing with the community. And so I think it's important that we share a more complete story um, so that everybody can make up their own minds or, or learn at least what happened. Um, yes, Randy, if I may... Sure, sure. that exactly we are um julia along those same lines at least i can speak for myself as a commissioner um we both we really do in, in looking at this issue we realize that we need to present all sides and that we do not um and i do not want to erase any history so yeah. but we want to compete present people as complete people giving both what some may view as their positive side and what others may view as their negative side so that is one of the reasons that um at least in the resolution we put forth the having the historical exhibit beside it and that actually when we say remove we do not mean to physically remove it um and just store it away we want it to be perhaps put in the exhibit um, right. as possible. Yeah, and I, I would say we're on the same page with that. I mean, we might act if, 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 um, permission was granted from the powers that be to remove the bronze plaque. Most likely what we would do is take some very high quality images of it and put those on the wayside exhibit and then put the plaque into our collection of historic objects. Um, just from a preservation point of view. Um, but other than that, you know, yes, we would, we would definitely uh, choose to consider putting a picture of the brass plaque right there on the wayside exhibit. So everyone could actually see it closer than they can now. But, but wouldn't that be only the case if in fact that plaque went through the proper channels to be placed there in the first place? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yes, like Brad said earlier, we don't know whether it went through the proper channels or not, and we don't know whether the Historic Preservation Office would consider consider it um, an adverse effect to remove it. Um, but even if they considered it an adverse effect to remove the brass plaque, 
the mitigate, we always, when we have an adverse effect and we proceed with it, we need to mitigate it, right? So the mitigation would be to interpret it on the wayside exhibit. Um, but it might be a good part of the story, even if there was no authorization and they just stuck this plaque in the ground in 1990, it still might be um, a good part of the story to tell um, because it's part of the history. And if we're, we're gonna, you know, I think that, I think it expands the story a little bit, you know, and makes it more complete and richer, but it would be, um, that would be something that, you know, we would work with historical association. And also there's um, a historical association of uh, African-American history um, folks that are active in Frederick, Maryland. And they actually recently did a documentary where they interviewed their most senior African-American citizens in Frederick. And one of these um, uh, ladies who they interviewed, who's in her 90s or something, um, from an oral history perspective, reported that her father um, was one of the stonemasons that helped build the Newlands Fountain. Um, so they're very interested in interpreting the more complete story as well. Um, can I jump in? Or yes. Thing? Great. Um, I just want to thank everyone, first of all, um, Julia, Brad, William, Professor Howley, thank you so much. We really appreciate like all the learning that's happening here. Um, I support this resolution. I think that Senator Newlands was many things um, and this fountain only tells some of those things and leaves out um, the racist ideas that he had and it's important for that history to be told. So we definitely should have a wayside exhibit. Um, and I think there's a lot of really intricate things here about the plaque, the tablet, the inscription, the naming, where of those things are on the physical fountain itself and where they might go. And we've gotten a lot of input from residents. I've probably gotten between 30 and 40 emails about this issue. Um, and a lot of that has been organized at a really grassroots level by some people who are on this call right now. And so I wonder, Julia and Brad, how can these people continue to participate? Yes. There's a lot of people that want to participate yes. in this. And I think if I were them, I might, I might leave this call feeling frustrated that I'm being told that there's three federal laws that are, are at play here and lots of policies that are really complicated and it's going to take federal legislation. And, you know, without going through an established historical society, without being a congressional staffer, but with being a citizen, and in many cases, I think some kids too, how can they stay involved? Um, because like, we're going to continue to do some things, but there's also going to be work that, that we're not going to do as an ANC um, that's a part of this. So well, yeah, yeah. Um, great. Um, well, if you all pass the resolution or a version of the resolution, um, then we will be actively working with the ANC or a subcommittee of the ANC to pursue this with you um, at your request. Um, and certainly if the ANC would help us, it would probably be appropriate to have some community meetings about it um, and people could come and share their opinions. Um, we, we would also happily work, for example, um, you mentioned young people. I mean, I'm guessing that Woodrow Wilson Senior High School history classes might like to get involved in helping us develop the wayside exhibits. I mean, that would be a wonderful uh, civic engagement project for some students. That is possible. Um, um, we are also uh, beginning actually in August um, a, a series, an, inter an interpretation program series on um, the racial history of Northern Washington as it pertains to park resources. Rock Creek Park has jurisdiction over uh, Fort Reno and all the federal properties in Northwest and Northeast DC. And of course, um, as you know, Rock Creek Park itself um, is the segregating line between Northwest and Northeast. That was actually part of the planning that um, that Senator Newlands did as, as well as the city surveyor Mel Melvin Hayes and, and others. So they really used Rock Creek Park as a segregation line. And that, you know, that it, uh, I see personally that the park 
could be rather than a, a dividing line, right? It should be a gathering common ground, right? And I would love to see that move forward. So anyway, we're, we, we're starting in August um, and we're going to do um, online programming um, until we can get together in person again. And even then we'll probably do both, but we'll be doing programs um, and activities related to interpreting the actual racial history as it relates to the parks. Um, and so the first one, and I will have to send you the exact date, but the first one I think is on August 9th, and it's going to be a book talk with the authors of the book Chocolate City. Um, and so that will be the beginning point, and then we'll be continuing on to do these. We don't have an end date in mind. We're just going to continue on to do them. So people can participate in them. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Um, is there anything else you can tell us about the process for the Wayside exhibits? Okay, well, the process for the Wayside exhibits is, is not um, prescribed like with policy, et cetera. So that is, we have a, we have a, a chief of interpretation. Um, her name is Dana Dirks. Um, she's in charge of interpretation and education and community engagement. Um, and so Dana will be sort of the project manager for developing the Wayside. We already have money identified um, to pay for them. Um, and we will be happy to work with the Historical Society, as I said, with students from Deal or Wilson or even Lafayette, you know, um, if they would like to have a, you know, some input into it. Um, the issue with Waysides is they have to be um, very concise language. Um, so you have to kind of really get the language tight because people generally won't stand and read it for more than about 30 seconds to a minute. Um, and this might be different because it's different from like being downtown and tour being a tourist downtown. You might be going to the fountain specifically to read this and then you might stay longer. But, but the text and the images have to be, uh, the text has to be written and, is, and the images have to be designed um, and then uh, we send it the final product when we're when we're happy and we're happy to consult with the community with it through the ANC or any other way. Um, and once the once the design is finished and we're all in agreement on it, we send it to a um, a fabricator and then they send us back, you know, the actual physical wayside and the and the ba and the base and then our our management maintenance crew comes and installs it. So. Um, that's the process. It can happen as fast or as slow as we want it to. If Dana were to write the text and do all the imaging herself, that would be very fast. If we want to include the community in, um, in their input on it at various degrees and levels, it will take a little bit longer. Okay, um, yeah, unless there are ADA or any further burning questions, I, want, I do want to get to the attendees and let them speak to this issue we're running yeah. behind schedule now but I, I i don't want to leave them out of the process yeah. no the only thing i would say is I, I think we we might want to say in a resolution that if possible students um and members of the community should be involved in the process for the exhibit i just think that if we're right now it just limits it to the historical society and if we're going to involve if we're not just going to kick it to the park service entirely I'd want to make sure that this is an opportunity for students and community members. I'm an educator and I really think like this presents an amazing educational opportunity um, and, and a real life educational opportunity. Um, and so I would, I would hate to leave them out unless, unless we're just saying, let's just give it to the park service entirely. So um, I could offer an amendment that does that, but I don't know if that's, if people are even open to that. And Abe, I might add that, um, you know, while, while we have to have, very concise language on the wayside exhibits. We can also put a web link and we can put a lot more information on our website. That would be great. Um, and then to speak on that, I also, I mean, it, it's simply a matter because we do have in the language including but not limited to um, Chevy Chase Historical Society. So we can add and students and community, um, the greater community. And we'd be fine that sounds like that. a second. I would offer an amendment then that says we should add students and members of the community in addition to historical experts. Would there, would there be a process that we would include in there? Because that's kind of general. 
So would we want a specific way that how we're going to include that? I'm hesitant to be too specific because I don't want it to get, I don't want it to stretch out. I mean, I think that the park service could probably do this in three months doing it themselves. And so I, I would want to keep it in the three to six month, hopefully range as opposed to the longer range. So I'd be hesitant about outlining too much of a process, but I don't know what other people think. We'll just have to, you know, it would be like anything else we do. Whoever comes, comes. Yes. Okay, Abe, I see that there's one person who's raised their hand. Could all the people who want to speak on this issue raise your hand, please? And let me just say that uh, ordinarily we try to keep our Zoom meetings shorter uh, than our normal meetings, but uh, in this instance, we're going to go longer uh, and it's inevitable. But, um, I, and I do ask that, that uh, anyone who is speaking, we're going to limit it to three minutes. And if somebody else has already made the same point, please either uh, skip your turn or keep your comments very much, much shorter than three minutes if you can, because we don't want to be here all, all night. Uh, Abe, we, I see there are three people with hands raised. Is that right? That's right. And I'm happy to, I'll set a timer. So we'll, we'll do our best to keep it to three minutes. Um, okay. I'll give you a warning when you're at three, if you please to please wrap it up. If you really go on, I will mute you. But um, we're going to start with Neil Flanagan because Neil is at the top of the list here. Can you hear me? Yes. I can. Great. Neil, you've got three minutes. Perfect. Uh, my name is Neil Flanagan. I wrote uh, the Washington City Paper article on, for, on the Reno community. Um, I've been researching, I'm writing a book uh, about the Fort Reno community and the origins of planning in Washington, D.C., um, for which Francis Newlands played a significant part. Um, so while everything, uh, and, and secondly, with uh, my writing partner, Kim Bender of the Heyrich House Museum, uh, who is also, I think, on this call, uh, we're writing a history of the Belmont development, which is an attempt to build an African-American uh, neighborhood at what is now the Saks Fifth Avenue and the Chevy Chase Center. Um, which actually a large number of players in the Fort Reno story were also involved in. I, I'm just going to say that um, to, to limit, to keep my points kind of obscure, um, one thing we know is that I've discovered a lot of connections about between Francis Newlands and these uh, direct, these events directly. Um, that is what Julie, everything Julia Washburn said is correct. Um, but it's, it's at the end of the day, it's at the end of the day still fairly incomplete because a lot of research on this topic just hasn't been done yet. Um, there are there are more explicit connections between the Chevy Chase Land Company and um, the elimination of Reno than um, have been uh, published in my article or, or elsewhere. Um, and uh, the second thing, but in terms of the significance of Francis Newlands, I think I think we want people want to talk about him as somehow in, um, significant for other things, and that his. You know, is that the Chevy Chase was the a leader in terms of suburbanization. In in my research with Kimberly Bender, we have um, not found that that in many ways he uh, the Chevy Chase Land Company was an early suburb, but it was not a, a an influential suburb. Uh, that that is largely based on a couple of of books that were written with material that was available. But since since then, um, particular documents have come have been uncovered in the literature in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, that suggests that Chevy Chase was sort of a, a cul-de-sac, if you will. Um, and the other thing is that his influence in, in, in Nevada, of course, you know, it's not as if he was a radically popular figure. He certainly was very influential in terms of developing the reclamation movement. Um, but as, as the scholar April Merlou has demonstrated, a lot of his interest in reclamation was about essentially in, in creating a space for white people in the West. Um, uh, that would be separate from the South and the black people in the South. 30 um, seconds, Neil. Okay. And I'll just, uh, in, 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 that, in that conclusion, um, he, he wasn't as significant. And certainly, uh, you know, the Nevada legis legislature appointed him. He was never elected uh, senator, although he was elected congressman. And it was, uh, uh, it was a fairly, contra you know, fairly corrupt. Uh, bar so I would just, I think that it's time to look back at, at his full legacy, and it may not be as, have the highs and the lows people think. Thank you, Neil. Okay, Neil, Thanks, Neil. I'm gonna make, make you back to being a. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, let's see. We've got Gary Thompson. Go for it, Gary. 
Gary, we can't hear you. Are you on mute? Hey, good evening, everybody. Okay, Gary, you've got three minutes. Okay. Um, first, thank you to the commissioners. I think everybody knows this is a volunteer position. So, you know, we really appreciate your time um, looking into this issue in such detail. Um, I really enjoyed hearing from NPS. Um, and I've learned quite a bit about this issue <clears throat> since the ANC first considered it in 2014. And I'm very thankful for this uh, extra time we've had to, to learn uh, a lot more. Clearly, in, in 2014, we were ahead of the times, and uh, considering this issue, it generated a massive amount of press at the time. Um, but it's very fitting that we're considering it at this point in our history with everything that's been happening lately. So, um, you know, I'm glad that we're here at this moment. Um, and of course, it matters to us uh, very much because um, Francis Newlands is the so-called founder of our neighborhood, um, of Chevy Chase both DC and Maryland, and um, his values are not our values. Um, we could not be farther apart uh, or farther away from um, uh, Newlands. His racist views, of course, um, are no secret. They were no secret at the time. Uh, he held them as a sitting senator. He espoused them as a candidate for president with his so-called white plank. Um, he tried to abolish the 15th Amendment. <clears throat> even, even in his own times, he was um, terribly backwards. Um, so we're quite um, happy to, to leave him uh, behind us. Um, but of course, history is not forgotten. Um, I really like the I idea of the interpretive marker uh, to put this in context, but what it's really about is who we choose to honor um, in our neighborhood, in our time and place. And uh, I'm so glad that we're at this first step, um, this certainly is um, a lot of detail and complexity ahead of us, um, but I think we we're all have a pretty good grasp on it now. And I, and I think, um, you know, the courage of, of taking um, action um, to commence the process, I'm hopeful that the, the pieces will fall into place. Um, and the last thing I wanna say is, is uh, I think for, for me and for a lot of people, this is, this has never really been about removal. Um, it's been more about the positivity of something new that uh, uplifting and that will mean a lot to us and to our children and our community. So, you know, with John Lewis's passing, I, I can't think personally of a better um, uh, being to, to name the entire circle after, frankly. I know that's a debate for another time, but that's really what it's always been about for me is getting to a point where we, we can still, um, really appreciate uh, what's happening in, in that circle that's a focal point of our whole community. So thanks very much. Thanks, Gary. Okay, next up is Lisa Gore. Thank you, Abe. Um, first, I just wanna um, thank the commission for its leadership on this issue. Um, Chandra, your opening was so eloquent. I was applauding you, very well stated, but thank you to all the commissioners for their leadership. I'm not gonna belabor the, the point. I agree with everything that everyone has said. Um, I put a comment in the chat box because my first thought when this came up was the community's involvement in the Wayside exhibits. That is really important to me. Um, my family has been in this Chevy Chase area, probably my husband was probably um, one of the oldest families on this block. We're on 31st Street off of Western. And I know the black residents and um, residents of color in this uh, Chevy Chase area have their own story, especially the ones that have been here historically for a very long time. So I just think it's really important for um, the commission to reach out and get everyone's input in this wayside exhibit because those stories connect to Newell's actions. They still, they felt the impact of his actions. So I think, you know, knowing their stories is part of our story as well. And I love the idea of, um, Abe, you mentioned you're an educator. I think you're spot on in involving our youth. I'm still doing uh, Zoom sessions with my son's history teacher at Wilson, who was awesome. I'm gonna send him an email about this and, and get him on board before this even gets started because 
Um, he's also, and I'm not going to mention his name because I don't want to put him on the spot, but he's very involved in the racial justice issues and keeping history lessons ongoing. So I, I just think you guys are just so spot on with this and involving our youth and everybody in the community. So really my comment is to say thank you. You're welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks, Lisa. You're thank welcome. you. All right, Ruth Robbins. Ruth, as they say, you're on the air. <laughs> uh, no, I, I had uh, I, I'm I'm I am had no no comments to make. I am um, oh. happy to see this uh, carry on here and and the enthusiasm for the Wayside exhibit and uh, friends of Chevy Chase Circle will certainly be supportive of that effort. But I, I had no questions. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's that's good to know that the friends are will be supportive. That's that's great because there's there's a lot of people involved here. Okay, thank you, Ruth. Um, I just wanted to say one other thing. Did the did that amendment? Do we pass that? That I offered? Well, we haven't voted on it. We haven't voted on it yet. The, the motion's okay. not actually okay. been offered yet. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, the only the only thing I'd want to say is whatever we do. Like I think a lot of people, a lot of other commissioners, like I said, we got a lot of emails about this and there's been a lot of interest. There's a lot of communication on the Chevy Chase listserv and other places as well. And I would just encourage us all to follow up with people who've emailed us about this oh, yes. with whatever we do today. Um, just to really keep people informed because not everyone's gonna be on the call. I've gotten more emails than there are currently people on the call right now. So we wanna make sure that people know what we do because this is a pretty complicated issue. Um, so that's my only other thought. And, and I will just point out as well, Abe, that we did post the draft resolution on the list serves on our website on Nextdoor. Uh, we, we tried to disseminate it as widely as possible so that everybody had an idea of what we were thinking about doing. Uh, so I, I, I think now maybe it's, right, it's time, Shanda, if you want to offer the, the resolution, um, and then uh, we'll have some amendments that Abe has already indicated he would have. And then there have been some other suggestions for amendments that I think are, are well taken. So we'll, we'll talk about those as well. So yeah. Shannon, you wanna offer the resolution? Okay, um, and for our residents who are out there, our resolution we have, rate, um, excuse me, Abe has placed it um, for viewing for everyone. Is that correct, Abe? So it's on the website and I'll, I'll, if you should be able to see it in the Q&A, but I'll post the link again in the Q&A right now. Yes. Um, so at this moment, I will offer the resolution. Um, Randy, do you want me to paraphrase the sections of the resolution or at this moment well, if, offer if it? You could just, if you could just describe the, the four points in the resolution yes. itself. Okay, yes. All right. The four main points in this resolution um, it basically are that uh, whereas ANC 34G respectfully, respectfully resolves that one, the National Park Service, as a first step, remove the Francis Newland's name plaque from the fountain located at Chevy Chase Circle. Two, the National Park Service, in conjunction with relevant historical experts, including but not limited to the Chevy Chase Historical Society, create a historical exhibit either in Chevy Chase or proximity close to the fountain that discusses Newland, racial and housing discrimination and other relevant issues. Uh, three, the ANC Task Force on Racism as a part of the substantive work group issues discussed make recommendations about suggested names for the fountain as a part of its official report to the ANC, council members, Che and Todd and other relevant government officials and lastly, four, ANC 34G, upon receiving those name recommendations, consider the recommendations as a part of the task force's report and hold a, a vote on the, the fountain's names and related next steps. And uh, basically this resolution in conjunction with our June 8th, 2020 resolution um, affirms uh, condemning racism affirms and solidifies our firm belief that there's no place for systemic racism in the Chevy Chase community and the United States of America. Okay, is there a second? Okay, now we'll, we'll take amendments to the, uh, 
to the resolution. Abe, you want to start? Sure. Um, I would just offer an amendment that, um, in addition to historical experts, that the National Park, we request that the National Park Service consult with students and other community members. Uh, Shanda, you want to accept that as a friendly amendment? Uh, yes, I accept that Abe is a friendly amendment. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Jerry? Jerry? Clarification? Uh, sure. Uh, the, the, the point in the resolution that talked about renaming, since we never talked about that really with the park people, what we talked about was um, the process that we went through. Do we want to include that renaming now as part of this resolution? Well, as I understood uh, Julia and Brad talking about it, uh, that's probably going to require legislation, uh, congressional leg legislation. And so I, I think we're a pretty long way off from being able to do that. Um, but I, I don't have any, I personally, I don't have any problem with our including it in the resolution um, and starting that process. Yes. Uh, you know, there's also, there's no name to the fountain, just control sure. the right. fountain, which I've got a lot of emails about. Yeah, that, that's an option as well. Right. Uh, so uh, it, we, we're not excluding or including anything in that uh, at this point. It's just... I just didn't want us to get bogged down because we talk about a vote in there, and I didn't want us to get bogged down in a, a voting process. Okay. Yeah, there, we'll hold a vote on the fountain's name and related next steps. Uh, how about if we change it and may hold a vote? I'm just making right. it Whatever we do is yeah. fine with me. Okay. Yes, I, I, I don't want us, I agree. I just don't want us to get bogged down, but I agree with you, Jerry. Yeah. Yeah, expedition is important here, I think. That we, yes. we, do things, we don't drag this out any more than is absolutely necessary. Abe? Um, one question in the chat from uh, someone named Cal. I didn't hear anything that ensures preserving the plaque for a future exhibit. And that is a good point. Do we want to say anything that we, we would want the plaque to be preserved for a future exhibit? Or do we leave that up to NPS? I just, I that did come up and we didn't really discuss I, that. I think that's getting into sufficient detail that we don't really need to do that in the, the resolution. Um, and that's my own view. Does anyone want to offer an amendment to, to that effect? We could, we could potentially add language and remove and preserve. That would, that would be fine. Isn't that getting in the weeds a little bit? Isn't the key thing to get Doolin's yeah. name off the mountain? I, I, I agree with yes. Chris on that. Completely. Yeah, we could use the plaque. Yeah, let's not lose, lose sight of the big the main right. thing here. Get yeah. Them off yeah. the no, I, I, I agree with that. No, I agree. But um, I just want to, well, it will also be in our, as legislative body, our historical notes that we want to have that done. <laughs> Right. Well, and it's not like this is our only only no. bite at the apple, right? We, no. we can always come back to this and we're going to come back to it to at least talk about the name in October. So, yes. Right. Oh, yeah, there, there are two other amendments that have been uh, suggested uh, by, uh, I've gotten emails about them. Uh, one is from uh, the Director of Archive and Research Center at the Chevy Chase Historical Society. And, and this is a, a factual issue. Uh, and that's where we say in the uh, we're asked clauses that uh, as part of the white plank uh, in his campaign for president, Newland's call for attending, uh, uh, amending the constitution to prohibit the vote for African-Americans. Uh, she pointed out that it was not actually in his campaign for U.S. president. Uh, he, it was a plank that he offered for at the Democratic yeah. Convention. And so we, we might want to just clarify that. Uh, yes. This is a factual historical matter. Yes, we will clarify that. Okay, and the other thing that was suggested in an email we received from the National Park Service today is that we, we just make clear that uh, you know the ANC doesn't direct anybody <laughs> to do anything, uh, even district agencies, but much less the federal government. The federal government is not required to give great weight to anything that the ANC 
says. And so unlike a, a district agency that at least must give it great weight, uh, that doesn't apply to a federal agency. So I think we ought to make sure that the, the resolution is in the form of a request to the National Park Service that they make these changes. Uh, I, it's clear from the responses that we got from uh, Julia and Brad that they're uh, certainly amenable to, to the kinds of things that we're proposing. Uh, but I think we just, as a matter of form, we ought to ask it, this as a request. Is that okay, yes, Shannon? Yes, I agree. Strongly worded request, but yes. 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 As strongly as we can, um, given the limited power that we have. Okay, with those. Could we changes, say strongly request? Would that make a difference uh, in terms of I don't, I don't, weight? I don't think it makes a difference. Okay, just request. Yeah, we'll just follow request. through. Okay. Uh, okay, we've made a, a number of friendly amendments to the resolution uh, with the second that we've had previously. Uh, all those, in, now I think we can go ahead and take it to a vote. Does anybody have any questions or comments before we go vote? Okay, all those in favor of adopting the, re the resolution, raise your hand or say aye. 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 Zero. Okay. Aye. Thank you very much. And thank you, Chanda, uh, particularly for all the hard work that you did on this and the research, and to Abe for organizing the, the conversations that we had with the National Park Service. Uh, that's also been extremely helpful. Uh, thank you. And to the National Park Service, they have done just a, a wonderful job, I think. And, and Julia Washburn has been uh, wonderful about helping us on a number of issues related to the Park Service. Uh, we really appreciate her and appreciate the, the National Park Service's efforts. Yes. And then, okay. Randy, before we move on, just quickly, I just want to lastly thank the community again for their input. And yes. along with our other commissioners, urge the community to continue to be as active and as vocal as you have been. And we look forward to continuing to work together. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. Hey, Randy, okay. I, have to drop, I have to drop off. I've got okay. family here. And, you know. Okay, uh, we, uh, we still will have a quorum so we can continue yep. to address the, the issues that remain. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, have a good rest okay. of the summer, everybody. Thank you, you too. Okay, there are only a, a couple of issues left. Uh, and the, the first one of those is a uh, discussion and possible vote on a resolution to support the Advisory Commission on Monuments, Markers, and Symbols Establishment Act of 2019, which uh, is, addresses a similar issue to the one that we've just been discussing about the, the fountain. Um, and this is a, a statute that was a bill that was proposed uh, by uh, Councilmember McDuffie in April 2019. And there were hearings in January on this issue, and, and the Office of Planning raised some concerns about the overlap between this bill and the, the work that was being done by the Commemorative Works Committee, which is a, has been established, I think, since about 2010. And that committee has similar kind of overlapping responsibilities to uh, the kinds of things that were suggested for this advisory commission, which would, in general, uh, look at survey all of the monuments and markers and other the street names and park names and everything else in the district and then would make some recommendations about uh, changes that needed to be made. And initially Abe and I talked to the staff, Councilmember McGovey's staff, and uh, were supportive of that kind of effort. But there is this overlap that exists uh, with the, the current Commemorative Works uh, Committee and then just on uh, July 23rd, the mayor announced that she has created a facilities and commemorative expressions work group called DC Faces to evaluate public name spaces in Washington and to provide recommended uh, actions on those. And this uh, working group, which is headed by uh, the mayor's senior advisor, Beverly Perry, and uh, co-chaired then with the director, the executive director of the public library, uh, Richard Reyes Galvin. Uh, and it would focus on DC government um, owned streets, buildings, parks, uh, neighborhoods, campuses, and statues on government, DC government owned properties. 
So it's very similar to the kinds of things that were proposed uh, by uh, Councilmember McDuffie. And rather than uh, supporting that legislation, which now is, uh, has been overtaken by events in many respects, uh, I think we, we can, should just at this point abstain from doing anything and let the mayor's working group proceed. That's going to uh, be certainly more efficient and it's going to act more quickly than anything that was proposed in council member McDuffie's uh, uh, bill. So at this point, I would not recommend that the uh, commission take any action on this at this point. Uh, any discussion or comment about that? I would just encourage residents to fill out the survey and be involved and we'll put the survey and link in our minutes so people can. That, that is a very good point, Abe, because they, they do have a good survey and the survey asks specifically about particular um, streets or parks or anything else that uh, people want, suggest should be changed because the names no longer reflect the values of, of our community. Um, and I had filled out the survey and uh, the, the two items that I identified uh, were the Newland Street and the Francis Newland Park, which are also in our neighborhood. Uh, and if we're going to consider uh, renaming uh, places because of uh, uh, Senator Newland's uh, history and his views, then I, I think we should look at those as well. So. Uh, anyway, I, we, we, everyone should uh, fill out those surveys. That's a, a, a very important data point, I think, for, the, for that advisory group. Any other comments? Okay. Uh, Shanda, do you want to give a brief report on the uh, Task Force on Racism and its uh, meetings that have been held thus far? Okay. Uh, tonight I'll split it with Jerry. Um, as you know, Randy and both you and Jerry and Chris have attended. Um, and as the community knows, this task force was formed as a part of the ANC's June 8th resolution um, against racial injustice. And so we've held two meetings. The first one was on July 15th. Um, and the second one was just recently on July 22nd. And as a result of um, residents participating, we have um, defined our working groups and are ready to begin our work. And I'll turn it over to Jerry to give you um, more of the details on um, what exactly our work and the ta our next steps are. Thanks, Shanda. Uh, so as Shanda said, we have, we've had two task force meetings. Um, and we've had about 25 people attend one or both of, of those meetings. And it's been a very engaged group. So let me first start off by thanking everybody. I know there have been some people on this meeting that have attended some of the task force meetings all, already. Uh, our next meeting is set for Monday, August 3rd. But one of the things we're doing between that last, our last meeting and the upcoming meeting is we've created work groups, uh, basically four work groups to take the work of the task force, break it out into topic areas and really get down to some nuts and bolts. And those work groups are uh, one called community, which is really a way to educate our community, whether it's workshops, book groups, uh, cultivating community relationships, um, ways to, to support residents of color, business diversification, anything that has to do with uh, community aspects like that. Another one is education and health. Uh, this is examining and identifying issues at local schools, including inequities in self-funding, recommendations for diverse and inclusive curriculum, and healthcare issues. And the third one is housing. And this is to include examining affordability issues, policies that encourage racial and economic diversification of housing. And then the, the fourth one, which is really an overarching work group that will help each of these others is data gathering. And this is to include designing surveys for the community to help the other work groups and to collect data that will help inform decision-making as we move forward, such as other data and statistics resource, resources from the DC government and other appropriate entities on issues such as policy, uh, policing, housing, business, education, et cetera. 
So we've been trying to get people to sign up for these different work groups. And um, as of right now, it's, it's incredible. About a little more than half the people have signed up. Uh, and of the 15 people, it's split evenly through the three work groups. Uh, so we have a lot of interest, although some people, a number of people said, I want to be on all three of them. So uh, we start off with the first uh, choice and we'll include people as, as uh, the opportunity permits. The work groups will set their own schedule for meeting. Uh, like I said, our next meeting is a full task force is Monday, August 3rd, at which time we'll decide on when we'll have future meetings, but the work groups will be able to meet whenever they want to. But this, this entire process, we're working um, as much as we want to be working uh, quickly, we want to be thorough about it as well. I believe our report to the whole ANC is due in October. Is that right, Shanda? I think yeah. it's October. According to our, um, the resolution we passed, we did put in there um, October, but we did, okay. did not say which week meeting, I believe. Is that correct, Randy? Yeah. Like anything that happens at work, if they say October, that means October 31st, yes. right? <laughs> so, uh, but, but that's what we're, we're working on right now. Like I said, it's been a, a great group. There's still, you know, if other people want to get involved, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, but there's some real issues uh, being discussed. And, you know, it's, it's really a way to, to do things in a more proactive way rather than to react to, you know, and I'm not saying that the fountain isn't a, an important issue, but we want to be proactive in tackling issues before they become uh, something that we want to say, you know, we should have been able to do something more. We want to do the more right now. So uh, that's where we are at this point in time. And I'll kick it back to, to Shonda to fill in anything that I've missed. Yes, and then as far as the fountain and naming issues, um, even as Randy suggested, a part of one of the work groups, which is we've entitled or given the overarching title of community, we will continue as the ANC's resolution asks to look at the street naming and the monument issue within the community. So um, the resolution is a piece, but we also have um, within the task force itself a piece that will look at those issues. Um, and as our resolution stated, we will um, come up with, or the task force will come up with concrete action steps that they would recommend um, to our ANC uh, and moving forward our community to working against racial injustice and uh, any sort of injustices in our community. Yeah. Thank you. It's been very, yeah, it's been very exciting working with the uh, socially engaged people in our community. Yes, there are a lot of active people and we appreciate that. A lot of ideas too. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much, Jerry and Shanda. Uh, the last item on the agenda is uh, a, an application for a public space permit. Uh, it's an Abe's single member district. So Abe, you want to uh, describe that? Sure. Um, I'm gonna give a very brief description and both in the interest of time and that I don't think this is controversial. I'm just gonna ask that we pass this without objection or, or that we don't object um, to this application. Uh, so there's a home at 6652 32nd Street. The owner is Christine Ott, and she's applied for a public space permit to reconstruct her driveway. The driveway is cracked in a few places, and Ms. Ott plans to replace it with permeable pavers. She also plans to slightly expand the driveway by three feet to accommodate what's called a flared apron because the entry to the driveway flares out. She currently has a hard curb cut, so cars must line up just so in order to pull in. She compared it to old style car washes where you need to actually pull into the car wash so that the conveyor belt can take you along. Um, most driveways have flared aprons to allow for easier access. The size of this curb cut would be within DDOT specifications as far as we can tell. And this to me seems like a reasonable improvement to the property. So I move that we communicate to the public space committee that this ANC has no objections to this application. Um, if they're if there are questions, please please say so. That's second the motion. Any questions anyone has? All those in favor, raise your hand or say aye. 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 Okay. Passes Thanks. four to zero. Okay, let's do the 
the final um, commission business uh, and we can be done. Uh, our minutes for the July 13th, 2020 meeting were posted on our website and on the various listservs. Uh, any comments or uh, changes that need to be made in those minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor of adopting those minutes, indicate by raising your hand, 4-0. Okay, uh, for, there are no checks to be approved this month, at least uh, not, none that I'm aware of. Uh, and the items for the September 14th meeting, we have a carryover of the bike share, uh, bike share um, station moving the location over to uh, uh, Northampton Street. I'm not aware of anything else at this point, but I'm sure many other things will come up. We'll certainly be talking about the task force on racism uh, at that meeting, and we'll probably be talking about any progress that's been made with regard to the name of the Chevy Chase Fountain as a result of our resolution. Uh, anything else anyone has? Okay, thanks for all the participants and attendees who uh, stayed to the end, and uh, we really appreciate all, all your participation. Um, and our next meeting, as I said, is on September 14th, and we look forward to seeing everyone then, at least virtually. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank Good night. you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.